galaxy spin in a heavenly dance, oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming. I hear the sound of your voice, all at once it's a gentle and thundering noise, oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming. I delight myself in you. Captivated by your beauty, I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. God, I run into your arms, unashamed because of mercy, I'm overwhelmed. So overwhelming, I delight myself in you, in the glory of your presence. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. God, I run into your arms, unashamed because of mercy. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. God, I run into your arms, unashamed because of mercy. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. Good morning. Welcome to Twickenham. Glad to have you here this morning. If you are one of our guests, thanks for coming out to be with us today. Um, Some of us are coming from a place of real peace and joy today. We've had a great week. Things are going great in our lives right now. And we're actually, we are overwhelmed by how God has blessed us and, and how awesome things are right now. Others of us, not so much. We're overwhelmed, but not because of all the blessings. We're overwhelmed with worry or with struggle or with shame or with problems. So wherever you're coming from today, whether it's a place of great joy or a place of joylessness, you're in the right place because we can, we can do all of that together. Um, just glad you're here. If you're struggling with something today, We'd love to to hear about that and be a part of it with you. Can't tell you that we can fix every problem, but you won't be alone in it. Just glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. If you're a guest, there's a card on the seat in front of you. If you'll fill that out uh, and put it in the collection plate when it passes by later on, we'd like to send a a note that says thanks for coming today and uh, have a record of your having been with us. Uh, If you are someone, uh, today is what, January 31st? Is that right? Is that the date? Okay. Does anybody still have their Christmas decorations up? Okay, we have a support group for people who haven't taken their Christmas decorations down yet. Okay, I'm just going to tell you, it's not in the Bible, but that's a sin and it's wrong. Okay, so we'll meet with you later today and we'll help you take care of that. Okay, that's just a thing that we, a service we provide to our community. Just saying. Hey, uh, Thank you for your encouragement uh, to us last week while we were gone uh, over to Athens. We had a great visit, enjoyed seeing our kids and our our grandbaby, enjoyed being with a church that was really important to us in a period of transition for us. It was really good to see those folks driving back to Huntsville. It felt a lot like coming home, and so it's good to be back. Thank you for being our home. We're glad to be here. Let's stand up. I want to share a scripture with you. From the book of Colossians, we're going to continue our series in discipleship today. So grateful for Scott Sager, who was here last week, and how blessed we are to have somebody of his quality to talk to us 
uh, and, and such an important person during a transition in our life, in, in our church life. And uh, Scott did a great job last week talking to us about friendship, which is an aspect of discipleship. We're going to pick that series back up today. And this is a great uh, passage to start with as we think about making discipleship just a, a, a journey and not a destination that we arrive at and we can say we're done with it. It's, it's going to be a journey for the rest of our lives. Listen to this, Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse uh, 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. And forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds us, binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And here it is, here it is, verse 17. And whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's give thanks to God the Father through Jesus right now as we sing. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise. And give him praise. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. Your voice is raised. Your voice is raised. Give glory and honor and power. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise, and give him praise. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart, your voice is raised, your voice is raised. Give glory and honor and power unto him, Jesus. The name of all names, Jesus, the name of all names. Be seated, please. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. As we take our offering this morning, think about that last line as we sing these next few songs, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Let's take our offering. Lord, speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of thy tone. As thou hast sought, so let me speak thy Master, let 
Tell me thy secret, help me bear the strain of toil, the fret of care. Help me the slow of heart to move by some clear Fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy, never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee. I've got a mother-in-law story for you, and uh, trying to prepare for this, I was trying to start this with a mother-in-law joke, but I couldn't find one that passed the wife test. Um, but if you see me after church, I've got some good ones for you. Uh, the reason I want to talk about a mother-in-law story is I, I have a life lesson that um, for 14 years my brother lived in Istanbul, Turkey, and his wife Cherie, uh, and children with him, for two of those years, my mother lived in Istanbul as well and taught school at uh, the academy where their children went to school. And if, for some of you know, in the Turkish culture, the uh, wife-mother-in-law relationship is not a very good one. Um, culture has that the husband will defer to his mother over his wife. And so when the wives then become the mother-in-law, they demand their sons defer to them over their own wives. And so generation after generation after generation, great animosity is created between the wife, mother-in-law. Well, I think my mother likes her two daughter-in-laws even better than her two sons. And she and my sister-in-law have a wonderful relationship. And as people would get to know them while living in Turkey, they were amazed that this was a mother and daughter-in-law, that uh, their relationship was so good. It's just very, very uncommon for what they were used to. And so it opened the door as to why. Why were they like that? Why did they have a relationship unlike anything they see in their culture? And that opened the door for obviously the gospel message. And uh, so as we just read in Colossians, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but basically live your life with the unbelievers so that they question why. What is it about you that's different? What is it about you that we wish we had? And so as we take this time to commune, I would challenge you to, to just spend time with God talking, thinking about you know, the, uh, the hope that you should have, the joy that you should have, the peace that you should have, and questioning whether you are being the model, the beacon to people, to seeing what they need in their lives, opening the door to share with them the gospel message. Can we pray? Dear Father, we praise your name, and we are so thankful that we have the example of Jesus uh, the way he loved us, the way he lived amongst us, the way he dealt with people. Uh, just, Lord, we're so thankful to have, his, have him, have him to model. Lord, we thank you for your word so that we can uh, know how to model Jesus, know how caring, caring and how forgiving you are. 
Lord, we just, as we take this time to pause and contemplate uh, you, to contemplate your son, as we do this in remembrance of him, we ask that you challenge us to be better followers of you, to be mo models within this community of what it is you would have us be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Earlier, I mentioned the hope, the peace, and the joy that should be yours that, that may be uncommon in this world. I forgot to mention love. That is the mark of the Christian. Above all, we should, we should be known for our love. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your love. We know you ask us to love. You command us to love. And we do it because you first loved us. We just reflect the love you send us, and, and we know that this world is, is a difficult, trying place, Lord, and, and your love is needed. Your love is really the only solution to some of life's hardest, most difficult problems. May we model that. May we show and glorify you. May everything we do uh, be a reason to ask someone to question themselves and to, to see what's missing in their lives and to start to question what it could be that could fill their lives that would make a difference. May we then share that story that, that you are that difference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Lord, I come, I, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without, without you, I fall apart, you're the Oh, you know. 
nothing on earth will compete for your throne. You are the sovereign I am, and you reign in our hearts alone. We will exalt you on high forever, King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. We will have no other gods before you. We will have no other gods before you. Nothing on earth will compete for your throne. You are the sovereign I am, and you reign in our hearts alone. We will exalt you on high forever, King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. We will have no other gods before you. Amen. Be seated. You guys are kind of a good mood today. I notice it. Well, most of you are. A couple of you. Everybody seems to be pretty good. Hey, years ago, at our at our first church, I was I was really trying to get a sermon done one day, and I I, I need blocks of I mean big blocks of time, like three four hours at a time, just to really get into it, you know and. I just, I kept getting interrupted. And people kept coming by, the phone kept ringing. I've always said you can get a lot of ministry done if it weren't for people. So, but these people just, they just kept coming. So I got really frustrated at one point, and I just, I told the church secretary, since you're not helping me here, I'm going to go home. So I went home, and at least it was at work, and I, I, I don't know where the kids were, but it, it, the whole house was empty. And so I, sp- I took, had all my books and stuff, and I spread it out on the kitchen table, and it was, Man, I, the, I just really started to groove. It was going. I mean, it was just like, mm. and then, then there was a knock on the door. So I went to the window, and I'm thinking I should not have a knock on my door. So I went to the window beside the door, and I kind of pulled it back, and it was a door-to-door book salesman. And I thought, man, I am not going to get into this, but he'd seen me. I, <laughs> and I, I knew... I knew he'd see me because he was like, so, so I opened the door, and but, I mean, I didn't even say anything. He said, hi, Mr. Vickery, my name is Joe, I'm one of those old Southwestern book salesmen. Say, you guys don't shoot us out here, do you? Ah, just hang us up by the thumbs, just kidding. I'm not talking to all the church people, you do go to church, don't you? And I just stopped him, and I said, look, I used to do what you're doing, okay? I did this. And I did the same corny speech, and I, and I know exactly what you're thinking. If I say no, you hear maybe. If I say no again, what you hear is, please give me more information. So let's pretend that I've said no 53 times, and I mean every one of them, because I am not going to buy a book from you or anybody else today. And he looked like I had kicked his dog. And he was a kid, and it was hot. It was July in Georgia, okay? It was just awful hot. And I said, I, I said look, I'm not going to buy a book, but would you want to come in and have, have a glass of tea? And he said, yeah. So he came in, he sat down at the table, and he started drinking this glass of sweet tea. And I, I asked him two questions, just two. I said, where are you from? And he said, I'm from Louisiana. And I said, that's a long way from home. Do you miss it? And for the next 45 minutes, <laughs> I did not do any work on the sermon. Okay? He talked about how much he missed home, how close he was to his parents, how hard it was to sell door to door, how mean people often were, how, su- <laughs> hey, I, he was at my table. And, <laughs> So he just went on and on and on. And, and honestly, okay, I've got a Bible and, 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 and Christian books laid out on a table. So he kind of knows, and it was not hard at all to turn the conversation toward Jesus. I mean, it was like a layup. It was so easy because here's a kid that's alone and frustrated and sad and hot and tired and somebody's being nice to him. Real easy to turn the conversation toward Jesus. And I, I went through the whole thing with him. I even, we even got all the way to talk about repenting of your sins and confessing the name of Jesus and being baptized got all that way and he and I I really appreciated his honesty because he said 
I'm not sure I'm ready for that. I, I need to talk to my mom and dad because I don't make big decisions like that without talking to them. So I want to I want to talk about talk with them about it. But I, I I'm going to think about what you said because nobody's ever really laid this out for me like that before. And and then the last thing you said before he left was and thank you for being nice to me. You were you were you you really made my day by by being nice to me. Six weeks later, that kid came back to my house to deliver the books that I bought. <laughs> I'm trying to save a soul here, okay? <laughs> so, um, you do what you got to do, right? So, and he said, Mr. Vickery, I, I'm still thinking about what you said. I don't know about it. It's, it's so different from anything I've ever heard, but I'm st I want you to know I'm still thinking about it, and I will never forget that you were kind to me. I will never forget that somebody that, that told me about Jesus was kind to me. I'll never forget that. Okay, look in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Uh, we are in this series on d discipleship, talking about what it, what it means to be a, a disciple of Jesus, to be an apprentice, a novice, a follower, somebody who's new at it, somebody that's trying to figure out how to do it. And we've been looking at the last chapter of the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 28, where Jesus uh, teaches his disciples about that. A few weeks ago... When we first began, we, we learned that being a disciple is not about perfection. It's about progress, which is really good news. Because once you realize you don't have to be perfect, you can, you can try some things. And then we learned that being a disciple is not about just being attracted to Jesus. Because lots of people are attracted to Jesus. But there's a real big difference between being attracted and recognizing his authority. So it's not enough to be a fan. You've got to be a follower. And then last week, when Scott Sager was here, I don't, I don't know that his, his, his talk was necessarily about discipleship, but one of the things he talked about was friendship, and, and that's a part of being a disciple of Jesus, is befriending each other and other people. Here's the, the, the kind of the big takeaway for today. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that up front, okay? Being, being a disciple is a journey, not a destination. It's a journey, not a destination. Okay, let's, let's listen to Matthew 28, 19, and 20. We'll look at two verses this morning, 19 and 20 of Matthew 28. Okay, here we go. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. If we're going to fully obey that command, and that's what this is, a command. If we're going to fully obey that, then we need to clearly understand what Jesus means. So we're going to have to spend some time this morning paying attention to the way this command is constructed. So I want to just tell you up front that you're going to have to do a little more listening work today. It's not quite as bad as when the ophthalmologist says you have iridocyclitis or swelling of the iris, but it's going to be almost that bad. How was that? <laughs> Thanks. The teenagers and I have a game. They give me a word every Sunday morning right before the sermon, and I have to work it in. Today's word was iridocyclitis. <laughs> okay? So... Normally, I try to put it at the end of the sermon so they'll listen all the way through, but I had to work, that was where it had to go today. So if you don't stay with me, I'm going to call you out today, okay? okay. You're going to have to work a little harder to listen today, okay? You just are, because some of this is going to be, it's, I think it's interesting, and I think it's challenging, but it's a little bit technical, okay? A little bit technical. So sit up. Take a deep breath. If you see somebody nodding off nearby, the elders have given you permission to take a selfie and post it on social media, all right? So verse 19, the word that carries all the freight is the word make. That's the main verb. It's got the shoulders in the sentence. It dictates all the action. There are three other words which modify the main verb make. Those three words are go, making, and, and uh, teaching. 
In Greek, those are all participles. Go making, uh, go baptizing and teaching are the three words that modify make. Go baptizing and teaching are all participles. And, and Greek participles are a lot like English participles. They're formed from verbs or nouns, and they usually end with ing. Usually, not always. They can modify nouns or verbs. These three words, go, baptizing, and teaching, are going to teach us something important about being and making disciples. So let's start with go. Technically, it's called a temporal participle or a participle of time. It modifies the verb make by identifying, this is important, okay? You with me? It modifies the word make by by telling us when the action of making disciples is supposed to happen. That's not how we usually hear this word, though, in in this passage. We We don't think about the when, we think about the where. When, when we hear the word go, we think it's sending us off in a direction. We're supposed to go to a foreign mission field or go on a spring break mission trip or go into all the world, which always refers to far places far, far away where they don't speak our language like California or New Jersey, okay? A better, if you're from California or New Jersey, we have translators uh, upstairs, so... A better translation, a better way to translate the word go here would sound more like this. In your going or as you go. So making disciples isn't something that only happens in far off places. During periods when you're on a mission trip, it happens wherever you are, whenever you are there. Making disciples isn't just a thing you go off and do. It's a way you live. It's not a week-long campaign. It's a lifestyle. It's not a, it's not a destination. It's a journey. Now, sometimes in the Bible, God did send people on long missionary journeys to go off somewhere and make disciples. Acts, some of you probably already thinking about Acts chapter 13 is an example of that, where Luke, the, the author of Acts, says that God set apart Paul and Barnabas and sent them on this wild, multi-year journey, traveling to exotic places, having extreme experiences, telling people about Jesus. Some people today are called to do that. I think about Justin and John Rieger, or Jake and Tanya Wilson, who are working down in Ecuador. They've been called to that kind of disciple-making. More often in the New Testament, though, God, God's people make disciples as they made their way through ordinary days. Again, the author Luke in Acts chapter 3, verse 1, tells us that, and and listen to how mundane this sounds. One day, Peter and John went up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. That, That was a normal, everyday kind of thing for Peter and John. At 3 in the afternoon, every day, they went to the temple to pray. This time, though, they encounter a man who has been unable to walk, and they heal him, And he jumps up on his feet and begins praising God. And so a crowd gathers. And when the crowd gathers, Peter tells them all about Jesus. They didn't, Peter and John didn't have to go very far to make disciples. Basically, they went across the street. And then Luke tells us one other interesting story. In Acts chapter 10, Peter didn't even have to go across the street. He was, maybe he was channeling James Taylor, but he was up on a roof praying and God came to him in a vision, and listen, listen to what God says to him. Peter, three men are looking for you. Get up and go downstairs. Sometimes you don't have to go across the planet. Sometimes you don't even have to go across the street. Sometimes all you got to do is go downstairs. God says, Peter, get up, go downstairs. Do not hesitate. Three men are looking for you. Don't hesitate to go with them. And then listen to this part. For I have sent them. See that last part? I have sent them. God doesn't always send us into all the world. Sometimes he sends all the world to us, one person at a time. Which is why how we understand the word go is so crucial here. It doesn't just mean go to far off places and do mission work. It can mean that. But more often it's going to mean in your going. In your living, as you just journey your way through your life, 
when you're, when you're at school or when you're at work or when you're at the neighborhood watch meeting or, or at your kid's ball game, wherever you are in your going, your life is a mission. So, so when are we to make disciples? Well, when you interact with your neighbors who live across the street and when you stand in in line at the tag office and when you order a grande caramel macchiato from Starbucks or when you chat with people between sets at the gym or when you sit in the stands at your, at your kids' ball games, even when you interact with people at work. And all of that scares us absolutely to death because the last thing we want is to come off like some kind of militant Christian door-to-door salvation salesman or a sandwich board-wearing street preacher. So I want to I give you a handle on this piece of making disciples, okay? I want a way to put this into practice. Here is what we are not talking about. We are not talking about doing this. If somebody comes up to you and says, man, it sure is hot today. Do not say, yeah, well, if you think it's, this is hot, wait till you wind up in hell. Can I tell you about my Lord and Savior Jesus? That's not, we are not talking about doing that. That is not how you make disciples. That's how you make enemies. Here's what we are talking about. I bet this is a pretty normal, natural thing for you. You're running at the grocery store. You're out somewhere. You're at a restaurant. You run into somebody from the neighborhood or from work or from your kid's school or from your own school, and you say, how are you? I bet that's a pretty, I bet you do that 50 times a week. Don't even think about it. How are you? Most of the time, When you ask somebody, how are you, say it out loud. What are they going to say? Fine, good, everything's okay. And most of the time, it probably is. Every now and then, every now and then, every now and then. That facade of normalcy that people wear to cover up all the chaos in their soul, that's going to crack when you ask, how are you? And when that happens, that's when you have your opportunity. You be Jesus to that person. You listen. You just listen. You're not not there to fix anything. You're not there to solve any problems. You're not going to rush in with a gospel message. You're just going to be there and listen to that person and be there with them and love them the way Jesus would love them. Maybe you will have a solution. Maybe you'll have the courage to say, I'm going to pray for you about that. But you just be there for them in that moment. Be Jesus to people when they hurt. That's how we do it in our going as we go. Okay? This kid that stopped by my house selling books, I promise you I wasn't out looking for him. I promise and I, and I don't know if he became a disciple of Jesus or not, but I know that in that moment, I listened. And that, you know, I don't always do things right, but in that moment, I did. I don't know if he became a disciple or not, but I know that God used me in that moment to move the ball down the field with that kid. Maybe somebody else waded into waist-deep water with him and baptized him. I don't know. But that wasn't my job that day. My job was to be Jesus to him in that moment. That's your job every moment we live. Okay, going. That's the first word. Second word we need to look at is the word baptizing. Go. In your going, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The word go was a temporal participle indicating the when of making disciples. The word baptizing is an instrumental participle. It defines how we are to make disciples. In case you're not familiar with the concept, and maybe you're not, maybe you had not heard this word used very often, baptism uh, is an ancient biblical ritual in which a person is immersed in water. It's a, it's a rite of initiation into the community of faith. Now, we've we got to avoid two extremes when we talk about this word, this, this word baptizing. On one side are those who view baptism as a good thing, but not a necessary thing. Those folks are, in in my experience with them generally, are not cavalier in their faith. They're not dismissive of Scripture. Typically, in fact, they're very sensitive to the truth that we are saved by grace, not by works, and they often see baptism 
as a work that earns us something, and so they're, they try to keep it in its proper perspective. The other, on the other side, the other extreme that we want to avoid are people who see baptism not just as a good thing, but as the thing. So you got some folks who see it as a good thing, but not necessary, and some folks who see it not just as a good thing, but the thing. These folks see baptism not just as a necessary step in the journey to discipleship, but as the ultimate goal of the discipleship journey. They aren't into works righteousness, far from it. They're, they're aware that we're saved by grace. But they, they think that baptism has been so minimized by the Christian community at, at large that they kind of tend to overemphasize it. So let me, let me say three things here about baptism. First of all, Notice that Jesus says more about baptizing than he does about either going or teaching. Look at what he says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He connects this religious ritual to the name of the Holy Trinity. That's kind of big. That's a pretty huge deal right there. So that must mean it's an important part of discipleship. Second, remember that a disciple is an apprentice, somebody who, who follows the master, somebody who does what the master does in order to become like the master himself. So since Jesus was baptized, it's kind of hard to imagine discipleship without baptism. Years ago, uh, there was this couple at, at another church that I was at, uh, Bob and Julie, and they, they came to our church out of another faith tradition, and they were not interested in being baptized. And I studied with them for months. We talked about, you know, I did Acts 2, I did Acts 8, I did Romans 6, I did all our passages about baptism. I did Matthew 28, 19, and 20. I did all our passages about baptism. And they always said, you know, we, are, we love Jesus, we're followers of Jesus, we don't feel like we need to be baptized. We're okay. We're okay. And I kept saying, no, yeah, yeah. And they kept saying, we're okay. We're okay. And they finally at one point said, we are okay. Okay? I don't want to hear it anymore. One Sunday, I was preaching out of Matthew chapter 3. It's a story about Jesus being baptized by John. And when Jesus comes to John, John the Baptist goes, hey, man, I'm, I'm not even worthy to baptize you. You need to be baptized in me. And then Jesus says, you need to let this happen to fulfill all righteousness. Well, at the end of the sermon, we have the invitation song, right? And Bob and Julie get up and they start coming forward. And I'm like, uh-oh, marriage problems. And they come down there and I say, what's going on? And they say, we want to be baptized. And I'm like, uh-uh. <laughs> they said, yeah, we want to be baptized. And I said, why? I mean, I've talked to you for months about this. I've prayed about this. I've talked to you Acts 2, Acts 8, Romans 6, Matthew 28. What, why now? I was kind of suspicious, you know. And they said, well, you'd never showed us that Matthew 3 passage where Jesus did it. We figured if Jesus did it, we ought to do it. <laughs> so I learned from Bob and Julie. So, look, if Jesus did something, that's probably something we ought to look pretty hard at if we're going to be disciples, right? Okay, here's the third thing. Since Jesus commands his disciples to baptize the people they make disciples, seems safe to conclude that he expected those who heard their teaching to submit to baptism. A few weeks after he gave this command, in fact, 3,000 people did just that when Peter preached in Jerusalem. So if you hear me coming down on the side of those who see baptism as the pinnacle of the discipleship journey, I'm not finished yet. In the text, baptism is not the end. Teaching people to obey everything Jesus commanded is the end. Baptism is an important, even necessary part of that process. But if you created a continuum, baptism would be closer to the beginning of the discipleship journey than to the end of the discipleship journey. One of the mistakes I made in, in, in the past was I practiced kind of a catch and release form of disciple making. I'd go fishing for people, you know, to use the biblical concept. And I'd, I'd convince them to get baptized, and I'd get them into water, and I'd baptize them. And it was like, I'd let them, then I'd let them go. It was catch and release. I'd let them go. That, Jesus says there's more to it than that. Baptism is a beginning, not an end. Otherwise, we're just dunking sinners. So is it possible to overemphasize baptism? Well, it's certainly possible to wrongly emphasize it. For those of us who believe strongly that Baptism is necessary. 
there's the danger of viewing it as, now listen to me, there's the danger of viewing baptism as a meritorious work that we do that earns us our right standing before God. It isn't, and it doesn't. As we'll see when we study the book of Ephesians in a few weeks, we are saved by grace, not works. And besides, baptism is not a work we do for God. Baptism is a work God does for us. Okay? For those of us who do not believe that baptism is necessary, there's the danger of contradicting both the example and the explicit teaching of Jesus. He not only submitted to baptism himself, but he taught his disciples to baptism. It's not a human tradition invented by the church to gin up commitment. It's a reenactment of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. If you have questions about baptism or what we teach about it, I'd love to talk with you about that. If, if you have not been baptized and you feel like you're ready, we would love to help you take that step in your discipleship journey. But it's really important to realize that baptism is not the destination. In many ways, it's only the beginning. And that moves us to the last word Jesus uses. Going, baptizing, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. The word teaching is another instrumental participle. It explains how we are to make disciples by teaching each other to obey Jesus. Do you know how the first disciples referred to Jesus most often? They, they called him teacher. I mean, he, he healed the sick, and he uh, raised the dead, and he performed lots of miracles, but when they, when they called him, they didn't call him healer, and they didn't call him miracle worker. They called him teacher because that's the thing he did the most and the best. Jesus was a storyteller, a certain man went up from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. A farmer went out to sow his seed. There was a man who had two sons. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many, many guests. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. It is hard to hear the first line of one of Jesus' stories and not move up to the edge of your seat and, and lean in and want to hear more of it. That's what he was, a teacher, a storyteller. Making disciples means we continue to tell those stories and teach the things he taught. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, we live in a world that's living on thousands and thousands of years worth of sayings it has heard. And it needs to hear what Jesus said. We need to hear what Jesus said. Okay, you remember the, the kid, right, that came by my house. Don't know whatever became of him. I know this, I did not go looking for him. I believe with all my heart that God brought him to me right to my door. God does that. God, in fact, may have brought you here today to make you a disciple of Jesus or to make you a more committed disciple of Jesus. If you are ready to obey his command to be baptized, we are ready to obey his command to baptize those who are ready. If you need to hear more of what Jesus taught, we're ready to teach what we know and then learn the rest with you. But I can tell you this, it's a journey. And it's a journey best made in the company of others. And here at Twickenham, we'd like very much for you to join us on that journey. We don't know where it's going to, well, actually, we do know where it's going to end up. We don't exactly know all the twists and turns we're going to take, but man, it's going to be interesting to go. We're going to stand, we're going to sing. If you need to come this morning, I hope you will. My heart, my mind, my body, my soul, I can't.
second uh, if you don't mind um, right at the end there I talked about how this is a journey best made in the company of others one of the reasons we need to make this journey together is because sometimes it's hard to do this because stuff happens in our lives and it it impacts our confidence certainly in ourselves it can impact our confidence in God it can shake us this morning uh, Nicole Dickinson has come forward I'm just going to read you what she wrote. Um, she says, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed. I may be losing my job. I'm stressed and anxious about the financial struggles since we just bought a house. And with finding another job as soon as possible, pre- please pray that our marriage will stay strong through this difficult time and that I may find peace with whatever God has planned for us. That's, we, we, I think sometimes we think that it's, you know, theology and scripture and this is real stuff. This discipleship stuff is real. And it gets down into what we do every day. It touches everything about us. And Nicole, you've blessed us just by reminding us of that. So we're going to pray for you. I, want you to, I wanted you to stay standing because I want Nicole to know that we're standing with her and behind her and Mitchell as they enter this, this season of concern and fear. Let's pray. God, thank you for Nicole and her courage just to come down and talk about this. I saw her writing this stuff even before the sermon this morning. And I thought she was just filling out a card, God, but she wasn't. She was pouring out her heart. And I'm so thankful that she felt confident in in us that we're safe. But more than that, that she has confidence in you to know that you hear us when we pray. And so we lift up Nicole and Mitchell in this season of change for them. They're young. They they hadn't been married all that long. And it's just a, a kind of a scary time. So bless them and take care of them and cover them and create opportunities for her. Help her to find a job. You, we have prayed about other people looking for jobs here and you provided and we're so thankful. So here's Nicole. We bring her to you. And you, you gave us work even in the garden. Before sin entered the world, you gave us work. So give her work, God. It's not a curse, it's a blessing. Give her that blessing. And as she waits for your answer, give her patience and courage. And help us to be with each other in our going, in everything that we do, no matter what happens. Help us to be making this journey side by side, knowing that we have you and that we have each other. In Jesus' name, amen. My heart, my mind, my body, my soul, I give to you, take control. morning for all of our senior members and our teenagers remember your time together we call it the feast 
when you guys share dinner and activities, that's February the 12th, and it's at 5 o'clock. We just need everybody to get a reservation, so please call the office and let us know if you're coming. And in your lobbies on your way out is a 2016 winter directory update of the eight, seven families who've placed members in the last couple weeks. So grab one of those on your way out so that you can have all of their information. Thanks for being here. Let's cl close in prayer, Daniel. Bow with me. Father, thank you for today. Uh, Father, thank you for all the blessings that you give us in this time to be together during worship. Uh, Father, as we, as we leave and we depart and we go our separate ways uh, and we head out into the world, Father, give us the, the fortitude and the, and, the, and the strength and measure to uh, go be disciples to all. Um, listen and love on, on, on them and, and just bring them closer to you, Father. I pray that we will all be reflective lights of Jesus as we leave here today and throughout our journey as followers of Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen.